Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh To carry on with the surgical anatomy lectures I'm gonna discuss in this presentation The anatomy of the diabetic foot I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and the head of anatomy department at Mansoura University, Egypt In this presentation, I'm gonna cover the following objectives First, I will talk about the skeleton and the arches of the foot and their support the deep fascia, the plantar fascial spaces and the blood supply of the foot and ankle. As you know that the skeleton of the foot is formed of three sets of bones, the tarsals, the metatarsals and the phalanges. This line represents the tarsal metatarsal joints and this line represents the transverse tarsal joint. These joints will divide the foot into three parts. The hind foot, it's a skeleton made by the calcaneus and the talus. The midfoot, made by the mid-tarsal bones or the navicular, cupoid, and uh, the three cuneiforms. And the forefoot is made by the five metatarsals and the phalanges. For the arches of the foot, we have two types. We have the longitudinal arch, which extends between the posterior end of the calcaneus and the heads of the metatarsals. It is like one continuous twisted arch, but higher on the medial side than that on the lateral side. So the medial longitudinal arch, as we can see here, is made by the following. The talus as its keystone, its posterior pillar made by the calcaneus, and its anterior pillar is made by the navicular the three cuneiforms and the medial three metatarsals. While the lateral longitudinal arch is made by the following bones, the keystone is the cupoid, the posterior pillar is made by the calcaneus, while its anterior pillar is made by the lateral two metatarsals. There are three factors that support the arches of the foot. Either the shape of the bones, we call it the bony factor, or the attachment of the ligaments, we call it the ligamentous factor, and also the pull of the muscles and their tonic contraction. For the medial longitudinal arch, it is supported or maintained by the ligaments and the muscles, not the shape of the bones. The most important ligaments that support the medial longitudinal arch is the plantar aponeurosis and the spring ligament or the plantar calcaneo-navicular ligament. For the muscles, we have the long flexors for the toes, like the flexor hallus is longus, the flexor digitorum longus, and also the tibialis posterior and the tibialis anterior muscles, plus the intrinsic muscles of the foot. For the lateral longitudinal arch, it is maintained by both ligaments, muscles, and also by the shape of the bones, especially the wedge shape of the cupoid. For the ligaments that maintain this arch, we have the plantar aponeurosis, the long and short plantar ligaments. For the muscles, the tendon of a peroneus longus muscle, which crosses the sole of the foot from lateral to medial, also the lateral two tendons for uh, the flexor digitorum longus muscle, and the intrinsic muscles of the little two. The second type of arches that present in the foot, we have the transverse arches. They are a series of smaller arches that run crossways the sole, it passes uh, through the head of the talus till the head of the metatarsals. The more prominent one is in the midfoot at the level of the tarsal metatarsal joints. It is made by the three cuneiforms, the cupoid and the phases of the metatarsals. The middle cuneiform is considered to be the keystone for this arch. For the support of the transverse arches of the foot, the shape and arrangement of the bones are partially responsible for stability of the arches because of the wedge-shaped metatarsal bones. These bones are held together by tarsometatarsal ligaments. But the most important factor that keeps this arch is the peroneus longus tendon. As I mentioned, it crosses the sole of the foot from lateral to medial, so it always pulls the medial end of the arch towards the lateral side, and also it is maintained by the tonic contraction of the transverse head of the adductor hallucis muscle. The deep fascia 
uh, of the sole of the foot is thickened at the center to form the plantar aponeurosis. It is triangular in shape. Its apex is attached to the calcaneus, while its base splits into five slips to the connective tissue around the fibrous flexor sheath of the toes. These slips are connected by ligaments, thus limiting the movement of the toes. The plantar aponeurosis gives a firm attachment to the overlying skin, thus gives stability of the foot on the ground during walking. It serves as a point for attachment of the intrinsic muscles of the foot. It also protects the underlying soft tissue like the vessels, nerves, and tendons and their synovial sheath. Also, it assists in maintaining the arches of the foot. Because it is made of collagen, so it is not stretchable. So upon dorsiflexion of the toes, the plantar aponeurosis will wind around the head of the metatarsals, thus approximating the calcaneus towards the head of the metatarsal bones and thus raising the arch. Finally, it acts as a leverage and absorbs shock. The plantar aponeurosis sends two septa towards the undersurface of the first and fifth metatarsals, so we have here the medial intermuscular septum and here the lateral intermuscular septum. Also we have what's called interosseous septal fascia. Thus this will divide the plantar surface of the foot into compartments. Thus we have here the central compartment which contains the muscles that form the layers of the foot at the central region. We have the interosseous compartment, which will be divided into four different compartments, each containing the plantar and dorsal interosseous muscle. We have the lateral compartment here, will contain the intrinsic muscles or the small muscles of the lateral two. And here, the medial compartment, which uh, contains the intrinsic muscles of the big two. These two diagrams represent the plantar fascial spaces. They are arranged from superficial to deep. So the first space lies superficial to both calcaneus and plantar aponeurosis. The second space lies between the plantar aponeurosis and the flexor digitorum previs. It extends posteriorly till the calcaneus and anteriorly it extends till the paces of the metatarsals. The third space lies between the flexor digitorum previs and the quadratus planti muscle. Also, it extends posteriorly till the level of the calcaneus, but anteriorly it extends a little bit till the mid of the metatarsals. The fourth space lies between the quadratus planti muscle and the tarsal bones. It extends posteriorly till the calcaneus and anteriorly till the pieces of the metatarsals. And finally, the fifth space lies deep to the adductor hallucis muscle. How these plantar fascial spaces communicate together and if there is infection in one space, could it be transmitted to the other one? We should know that the first space that lies superficial to the calcaneus and the plantar aponeurosis is closed and does not communicate with the other spaces. So if there is infection there, it will be confined within it. Spaces from two to five communicate with each other. so infection in one space could be transmitted to the one above or below it. However, the most important one that we should know is the third space because with minimal pressure its anterior septum could break down and the spread of infection could be transmitted along the slits of the plantar aponeurosis to the toes. Also because the main blood vessels and nerves of the sole of the foot run in this space so infection could be transmitted along the neurovascular bundle and below the flexor retinaculum upward to the potential space between the superficial and deep compartments of the posterior leg. For the blood supply of the foot and ankle, we should start with the definition of the word angiosome. So angiosome is an anatomic unit of tissue made of skin, subcutaneous tissue, fascia, muscles, and bones. These angiosomes are supplied by what is called a source artery. The adjacent angiosomes are bordered by chalk vessels. These are vessels with smaller diameter than the source artery, but they have the ability to dilate and increase the blood flow of them 
if there is obstruction of one of the source arteries to the corresponding angiosome. We have six angiosomes that are confined to the foot and ankle. They are supplied by branches coming from the three main arteries of the leg. These are the posterior tibial artery that will supply the sole of the foot, the anterior tibial artery for the dorsum of the foot, and the peroneal artery for the lateral supramalleolar area and the heel. Here we can see the branches of the anterior tibial artery. It gives lateral and the medial malleolar arteries and then continues in front of the ankle as the dorsalis pedis artery. The dorsalis pedis artery then gives the lateral and the medial tarsal arteries, the arcuate artery which passes laterally and gives the second, third and fourth dorsal metatarsal arteries. Then the dorsalis pedis artery will give rise to the first dorsal metatarsal artery and then dips in the first intermetatarsal space and make a union with the lateral plantar artery to complete the deep plantar arch. The posterior tibial artery passes behind the medial malleolus deep to the flexor retinaculum. It gives first the posterior medial malleolar artery and the medial calcaneal artery and then after it enters the sole of the foot, it gives the medial plantar artery and the lateral plantar artery, which will curve medially to form the deep plantar arch. Finally, we have the peroneal artery, which lies on the lateral side of the ankle. It gives the lateral calcaneal artery and anterior perforating artery that will communicate with the branches of the anterior tibial artery in front of the ankle. To summarize the angiosomes of the ankle and foot, the dorsum of the foot is supplied by the dorsalis pedis artery, the heel is supplied by branches from both posterior tibial artery and peroneal artery, the medial third of the sole of the foot is supplied by branches of the medial plantar artery, while the lateral two-thirds of the sole of the foot and the four digits or four tools are supplied by branches from the lateral plantar artery. The big two is supplied by branches from the dorsalis pedis artery, the medial plantar artery and the lateral plantar artery. This will be the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like and share. And do not forget to hit the notification bell so you can know if I upload another video. Please leave a comment below. See you in the next video. Thank you.